Hi, it's me again. Welcome back to It Builds Character, a series where I talk about designing things and maybe do some draws. So this episode, I'm going to be focusing on non-humanoids, courtesy of a couple comments from the last video. I'll be the first one to admit that humanoids are definitely my comfort zone, but I think it'll be a lot of fun to try something different. This episode is going to be structured a bit differently than the last couple. I won't be doing any speed draws, but instead I'll be going through a list of questions and notes to consider when you're designing non-humanoids. Now, you obviously don't have to go through every single question every single time you want to design something. I've designed multiple non-humanoid things with only a couple questions guiding the process, sometimes just a sketch. But thinking more on it, these are things that I think will be really useful to consider whenever you're designing your little critters. So, the first question to consider, what is the creature's natural environment? Does it live on land, in the water, in the sky, or something else? More specifically, what sort of biome is it? Is it a forest creature, a desert dweller, does it live in the Arctic or underwater, or something else? Maybe it's native to a fantasy sort of environment, like the, the hella edgy dark Shadowfell, or the super magical and kinda really weird Feywild in Dungeons and Dragons. Its home environment will inform its adaptations, appearance, behaviors, and honestly everything else about the creature. So next question, what is its body type? Is it bipedal, quadrupedal, flying, insectoid, aquatic, is it an amorphous blob, etc.? How does it move? What is its gait like? Its swimming motions, its flying motions. A slug and a cheetah both live on land, but one of them sprints and the other one, you know, slugs. Question three, what real life organisms can you draw inspiration and reference from? It doesn't have to be just animals. Plants and fungi and even things like bacteria can be great sources of inspiration. In the campaign that I run for the group, there are these creatures called flower folk that are based on real life flowers. The three that I've created stat blocks for are based off of bat flowers, devil's hand flowers, and angel orchids. So bat flower folk have these long, stingy tendril things based on the wispy bits that you can see on the actual flower. Devil's hand flower folk are immune to fire damage, and angel orchid flower folk hover and have immunity to radiant damage. Since they're plant-based, they're reliant on sunlight and become inactive in the darkness. And that's just plants, we're not even talking about mushrooms yet. Those are cool as shit! Just look at failed lady mushrooms! It's so aesthetic. Okay, anyway, question four. What does it do? What does it eat and need to survive? Where does it sit on the food chain, or whatever, whatever? Is it a predator, prey, producer of something, or a scavenger? What is its purpose, if any? A creature's diet and position in the food chain will inform multiple aspects of its design. Herbivores will have these strong, flat molars because they've got to chew through leaves and shit. They're not going to have prominent canines if they have them at all. Conversely, carnivores have way more canines because they've got to tear that meat off their prey's bones, and they're going to have few, if any, molars at all because they don't want to chew through grass. And omnivores have both, like humans do. Or if your creature is plant-based instead of animal-based, it might have plenty of flat protrusions or other features that give it lots of surface area to soak up that sweet, sweet sun. So question five, depending on the setting you're designing the creature for, what are its abilities and, if any, supernatural powers? Obviously this question is not going to work for every setting, it's a little more geared towards fantasy, but it is a fun one. Stereotypical dragons breathe fire. How do they do it? Are they themselves fireproof? Are their guts and their throats fireproof? Think of how they perform supernatural feats and let that inform your design. Alright, question six. How intelligent or sentient is it? Does it have a form of communication? Is it sentient enough to speak? If so, does it have its own language? Which lends itself to question number seven. Is this a community-based creature or is it isolated? Is it the only one of its kind? If there are communities for this creature, is there any sort of group hierarchy present and what does that look like? What sort of behaviors are present within the community? So question eight. If the creature is sentient enough, does it have an alignment or a personality? Is there a certain alignment that the entire species tends toward? Your creature doesn't even have to be that sentient to have an alignment. Plenty of critters in the D&D monster manual are dirt shit stupid and still have an alignment. Even if most of the dumbass ones tend toward evil, but that's just them. So the last question isn't so much a question as a tenet to keep in mind. You always want a functional design. The creature's design should reflect what it does. And then you can go ham with adaptations based on the creature's lifestyle and environment. There, there are too many possibilities to get into in one video, but as an example, I'll go through some adaptations that you see in desert-dwelling organisms. So one big thing is size. You can't hide from the scorching sun when you're an absolute unit. Lots of animals also know to seek shade or burrow to get away from the heat, and some are just nocturnal. Some critters, like fennec foxes, have those big ol' ears, and it's not just to make them look cute, they're that big because it helps them dissipate heat. 
And you know how meerkats have that killer eyeliner? That's an adaptation to keep sunlight from reflecting back into their eyes. It's like how football players put that black gunk under their eyes whenever they play and it's sunny or whatever. And a lot of desert dwellers don't even need to drink water. They get all that they need from their diet. And so another general note that's more relevant if you're drawing your creature. Establish your shapes and silhouettes early on. Play with arrangements and big basic shapes before you get caught up in the details. That stuff can all come later. Get the most notable, most important details decided early on. Okay, so before I sign off, I want to just sort of briefly touch on some design ideas for demons in particular, uh, based on one of the comments asking for non-humanoid tips. Now, I haven't done much demon design myself, but I do know what traits make things unsettling and scary to me, so here's Caitlin's hot take on things to make your demon boys more... Uh, demonic. So the first thing is teeth. Maybe they're big chompers, maybe they're a bunch of little teeny chompers, maybe they're spiky chompers, maybe they're human chompers. We've all seen those cursed images of animals with human teeth, and we all know how godforsaken they are. And even better is having teeth where they don't belong in weird mouths. You ever seen that goddamn Demogorgon? Case closed. So anyway, second thing is eyes. Too many eyes or no eyes, both are creepy, and they're especially creepy if they're not where they're supposed to be. Animal eyes are really good sources of inspiration if you really want to get into some funky pupil shapes. The third thing, speaking of funky things, is funky limbs. I'm talking too long, and not too short because then it looks silly and no one takes it seriously. We've all seen a T-Rex. But too long, too many, in the wrong goddamn spot, at the wrong goddamn angle. Can you imagine how weird it'd be if dog's legs bent the other way and they just walked around like that? God spelled backward indeed. So last thing is the uncanny valley. Obviously this won't work all the time if you're not doing humanoid characters, and I don't mean like how some robots look almost human but they're not quite human so then it creeps them out. But I think that adding a few humanish elements that do not mesh well with everything else can be really unsettling, especially if everything else is pretty much normal and it's just that one thing that makes it not sit well. What if a cat had like human hands? with fingers and everything, but nothing else is different. Just had hands. Or like a fish with human eyes. That'd be weird and ungodly. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this episode of It Builds Character. I hope some of these tips were helpful. Uh, it was a lot of fun to get more analytical with it. Questions, questions are fun. So anyway, if you have any potential suggestions for the next episode, let me know in the comments. It could be a general thing like this one, or a specific character design you'd like to see explored. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!